Hey guys, welcome back to the ACE podcast. I am your host, Darren Joe, And on this show, we talk about the independent work life and how to maintain your well-being on this path. About a year ago, I interviewed Mimi Kuo Diemer on the show. That's episode number 15. And we talked about her book, Xiu Yang. And that episode was really well received. So I wanted to get Mimi back on the show to talk about her first book, which is called Qigong and the Tai Chi Axis. Mimi has been practicing and teaching Qigong for nearly two decades. And I selfishly wanted to, you know, just ask her more questions about my own practice and and to kind of explain the concepts in her book in more detail. So that's what we do on this show. And Mimi also leads us through uh, the practice of wuji or emptiness stance. So you can follow along wherever you are and practice along with us as well. So I hope uh, you enjoy this episode. I'm going to be instituting, as Mimi recommended, like a 10-day, 10-minute practice just to get started and just to build momentum doing this every morning. You know, if you enjoy what you heard on this episode, you can also find uh, a number of videos on Mimi's YouTube channel. Just search Mimi Quadimer, and I put the links to her videos and her site in the show notes for easy access for you. Okay, so enjoy the episode. Here we go. Mimi, I'm I'm just going to read a, a blurb from you about you from your book, if you don't mind, to introduce you, because I, I just really love how um, it might frame our conversation. So, Mimi Kuo Diemer is dedicated to sharing the ways in which Qigong and other healing arts can help people meet the messy, complicated job of being human with greater awareness, compassion, and ease. She's a teacher of both students and of other teachers having practiced and taught for over 20 years in China, the UK, Europe, and the United States. So Mimi, thank you once again for coming on the ACE podcast. Yeah, it's really, really great to be back. Thank you for having me again. (laughs) Yes. So, you know, I thought we could sort of frame the conversation in terms of, uh, in a selfish way for me, (laughs) because my grandparents were... Qigong practitioners. And I used to watch them as a little boy, you know, uh, go to the park, I'd be running around, of course, but I would always wonder, why are they moving so slow? And, you know, what are they doing? But I would never dare bother them, right? Because I could tell they were just so into it with their friends as well. And so they kind of planted the seed of this, this ancient art form in me. And I've always really wanted to get started with Qigong for various reasons. That's why I bought your book. And I'm hoping this conversation takes me to the next level and I'm that I can stand in for my audience, right? And and learn more about these concepts from you because you've been teaching these concepts and, and practicing them for so long and hopefully get us all started on our Qigong journeys. Uh, so the, the first question I'd like to ask you is, you know, how did you encounter Qigong? So I probably was like you, you know, I saw people in my circles, older generations of people, not my parents, they sort of rejected a lot of that. Um, But I saw a lot of them doing it when I'd visit China, I'd see them in the parks doing it. And I sort of knew about Qigong um, more generally. My grandmother also was uh, a Tai Chi swordswoman. And she was quite badass in her time. Sounds like it. (laughs) Yeah, I wish I'd learned from her. I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, But when I was mm, 13, I went to China with my brother on this big trip. And it was called the Cradle of China. And they took us to the origins of the two rivers. They took us to sort of the the cultural um, hotspots where Chinese civilization, they believed, was uh, spawned. And one of those places was the Shaolin Temple. So we spent three or four days there, I think. And every morning we had a Shaolin monk come teach this group of Chinese Americans and overseas American, overseas Chinese Qigong. And I was sort of a grumpy, slightly anti-establishment 13 year old (laughs) 
But that meant that I was also into weird stuff. So I was really into this guy teaching us this very strange movement form, but we only got to do, you know, three, four days of it. I loved it though, because I was doing dance and I had a sort of interest in movement up till then uh, from my mother. But it wasn't until later when I was in, uh, in China and I met, actually I was in Los Angeles, but I was living in China and I met someone named Matthew Cohen and he is American, Caucasian, Jewish, Californian, raised in, you know, difficult parts of Los Angeles. And he was teaching a combination of yoga, martial arts, qigong. Um, he was a, he has a dance background as well. And his fusion of these things was mind-blowing to me. Uh, I liked it quite a lot. And I had a conversation with him afterwards in, in the studio where he was teaching. And I said, you know, we've just opened this yoga studio in China. If you ever get the bug to travel, let me know. And we could maybe host a workshop or something. And he took me up on the offer, came to Beijing, was an immediate easy fit with our studio and our students and myself and my, my business partner and good friend Robin. And he taught Qigong, uh, fused with yoga, but he taught a lot of Qigong. And when he taught me how to stand in Wuji, and he was a very, very good teacher, I felt something that I had not felt when I was doing yoga. And it was, it was a hotness in my hands, a groundedness through my feet and my body, a sense of being very here, but at the same time, everywhere and vast and spacious. And I was, I was a little miffed and a little bewildered and very excited. And that, that, that sense of, oh, what is this? And it was an energy practice sparked my curiosity and it's sort of been my like qigong has since that point been embedded in my yoga practice and it, it's it's also taken on a form of its own or it took on a form of its own kind of a uh, place in my life my um my my other influence then was cameron tukapua and i, I find it interesting that there, there are non-chinese teachers who have studied these uh teachings and then it was in china that i learned them <laughs> so there's there's a whole kind of mix up of things happening, but she's from New Zealand and she's an acupuncturist who is a very close friend of my yoga teacher Donna Farhi. Cameron I met in New Zealand and I again I extended the invitation to her to come because she would you know she was very interested in making a trip to China. She said you know she'd love to teach some sort of a retreat around the the five elements, and so we hosted her and. She opened my eyes and she sort of opened my sensibilities to the idea of elemental constitutions and the idea that I could be, I, I was able to reframe my perception of myself through nature and through her, um, its cycles, changes, balances or imbalances. And I, 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 uh, learned some five element forms of Qigong from her. Um, so, you know, sort of those three things, the Shaolin Temple, Matthew Cohen, and Cameron Tukapua, um, that was how I encountered Qigong. Um, wow. And, yeah. and how many, this was in the early 2000s, right? Where you had these first classes with uh, Matthew and Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. Very, about 2003, 2004. Yes. And at the time, uh, you know, you had the yoga studio in Beijing, um, as we learned uh, from the last podcast. But how do you see Qigong and yoga in relation to each other? Because I'm sure most of our audience is familiar with yoga, but might be less familiar with Qigong. And I'm wondering uh, how you view them in your practices. Yeah, um, well, to start with, I'll, I'll focus on yoga postures because yoga is such a broad category that it can, you know, it can involve chanting, it can involve devotional practices, it can involve meditation practices. In terms of yoga postures or asana, which is what is most widely practiced, I think, in the world, there's a sense of linearity to the forms to the postures, there's a sense of extension. You know, generally, it's that you you see people 
uh, in extreme cases, doing, you know, crazy deep back bends, their leg behind their head, balancing on one hand at the edge of a cliff, right? <laughs> Has to be at um, the edge of a cliff, but, yeah. <laughs> It does not have to be like that to be <laughs> to be clear. And <laughs> yeah. you know, my draw or interest in yoga certainly was perked by those images, and they look a little bit sexier. Um, but on the whole, qigong forms tend to be much more rounded and circular. Some yoga, like a yengar, which is probably the most uh, widely practiced form in in the world, maybe now. Vinyasa is, I'm not sure, but um, Iyengar was a series, you know, of statically held postures, whereas uh, Qigong forms tend, there are static postures in it, like you stand in Wuji or you stand in different forms, but uh, the majority tend to be fluid and uh, unbroken in their movement. Yeah, so what I find, though, is that over the years, my practice has been so infused with principles that underlie Qigong um, that I couldn't do yoga without an underlying influence of, of these ideas. Also, just to say, you know, I've integrated some of these concepts with, you know, Qigong and yoga within the vocabulary of Qigong. I'm using the vocabulary of Qigong. You know, there's concepts like effortless action, there's um, sinking, of yielding, of immersing, of um, you know, opening the spaces in the joints, being relaxed. These are not um, sort of exclusive rights, right? The Qigong doesn't have exclusive rights to these concepts whatsoever. And in the somatic world, there's a lot of, you know, in the dance world, the somatic world, there's a lot of reference to natural movement you know how do you find kind of ground gravity and space in your relationship between them qigong i think has just from its get-go had these qualities of universal movement patterns guiding the the orientation of movement so i think uh, you know using qigong principles into the yoga practice is deeply healing because they, they follow natural movement patterns. You know, there's an inherent respect for seeing your body as an integrated whole and that is you know, very informed by you know, how you are standing on the ground, how you are in relationship to the sky, um, you know, how the body is 70% or more fluid and how we access and respect that as we move. I can't wait to dive into these principles and these concepts. But before we do, I just have one more question about how the practice has helped you with you, with your health and how it has changed your life before we start to dive into, you know, these concepts. Yeah, I think when I wrote the book, uh, I was quite open with the way that I kind of was not very much fun to be around because I was so kind of mentally, physically, and emotionally a mess. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that, you know? I mean, I don't, I know I don't know you really well, but I just can't imagine that. Yeah. Oh, well, I think um, I've had a lot of people write to me saying that it really helped them reading that in kind of the first few pages of my book. Uh, and, and I'm not shy about that because I think this is why I do Qigong. And I've really worked through persistent health problems. And Qigong has been the primary vehicle for that. Yoga is a big component of that. I would say yoga was the, the, the spark. And it shifted me to start seeing things a lot more clearly. It really made me happier, yoga. But Qigong healed me in a way that, that yoga wasn't wasn't doing. And I was doing the yoga practices pretty regularly for a few years, but I still had constipation, chronic kind of digestive issues related to that, a history of childhood asthma that would flare up regularly, uh, general high levels of anxiety. Uh, working in China, working as a photographer, I was burning out very regularly. I was quite fleshy and kind of bloated, even though I was doing all this asana and 
kind of, you know, strong, sweaty yoga practices, I just felt sort of puffed up. <laughs> and when I started doing a regular form of, of Qigong practice daily, and this was the five element practices, and then some of the things that Matthew taught me as well, I did them very regularly uh, while I was going through a very hard year of my life. But despite the challenges, and I was traveling like six months out of the year, I was away from home doing assignments for photography. While all of this was playing out, my digestive problems sorted themselves out. My energy levels changed. Uh, my asthma was barely, you know, coming up. And I started noticing a shift in my body shape. And it wasn't through changing very much, but it, other than the, what I was practicing and then beginning to follow as a result of being interested in the Qigong, following as well the five element theories and, and changing the ways that I structure my day, you know, eating more in the morning, less at night, stopping work at a certain hour, you know, things like that. Uh, but I, I just, you know, I felt the benefits to me physically, but because Qigong sees the body as qi and um, qi manifests you know, through the organ system differently and e e all the organs have corresponding characteristics and qualities related to your emotions. So they don't separate out kind of mind and body so much or emotion and um, physicality. You know, in China, for example, if you have a lot of fear, most people are familiar with Chinese medicine. They'll say, oh, you have a problem with your kidneys then, huh? <laughs> so it's like... Right, you know, right. So it, 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 I felt emotionally much more uh, steady. You know, it was always kind of one step back, two steps forward sort of thing, but I really felt the difference Later, I also, you know, I moved to London and I was teaching quite a lot of yoga and just trying to introduce some Qigong into my classes and some workshops. Um, but I, again, I suffered a big health setback and I'm, I'm not shy about this either. You know, I had um, a series of miscarriages and one of the miscarriages resulted in, you know, heavier cramping, pain, bleeding. And a woman going through a miscarriage will probably know what I'm talking about, where when you, you after a miscarriage, there's a lot of self-judgment and blame and questions and injustice and whys, but also just like a little bit of violent anger towards my body. And I, I felt like I just wanted my body back and I wanted to start moving again. But the moment I started doing yoga asana, the cramps would come back. And I, um, I was, you know, the first time it happened, I was sort of not dealing as well with it. The second time the miscarriage happened, I learned a little bit, um, was more gentle. But each time what I found was Qigong helped much more. Like I just did very gentle uh, visualization practices, breathing into my different organ bodies, moving the qi through the, the meridian pathways that I was familiar with. And especially that second time of, of miscarriage, using energy, using intention, something far more gentle. It was so therapeutic and, and very healing to me, not only on a physical level, but mentally and emotionally. So, you know, I think I, I found the approach is nourishing but the approach is also something that um from my personal experience is you know it's been like a salve to wounds that mm -hmm. i just mm -hmm. can apply and and it, it's you know yeah it's not see ya, you know it, it won't solve all your problems and more and more i you know i i try to remind students of this as well that it's preventative medicine it can help it has helped me when health issues come up, but over the years of having a more consistent and regular practice, I just noticed fewer health issues coming up. I occasionally still get the asthma if there's kind of dust mites or crazy uh, pollen happening or major stress, but it's few and far between now, those incidences. 
Uh, my digestion is super regular now. You know, I feel very healthy. And I think my marriage is better because of it. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, my, my, it's, it's just, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot to complain about. And I feel very blessed in terms of health that is inclusive of my physical, mental, and emotional health. So, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, you know, I think of one of my uncles, not my real uncle, but one of my uncles growing up who he grew up in China and he had really bad asthma too until he learned Qigong and he's been practicing every day since he was a teenager and it helped him overcome that. He always shared that story and watching him practice is just uh, it's such a beautiful movement to, to, to see. And so I'll, I'll be sure to link to, you know, some of your YouTube videos as well so people can see, you know, instead of just hear what we're talking about. But getting back to the book, right, let's dive into some of the concepts and, and maybe we could frame it this way. You know, why did you call your book Qigong and the Tai Chi Access? Why not just Qigong? <laughs> oh, um, there's a few explanations behind that. One is it was originally just Qigong nourishing practices for health and well being. Uh, or body, mind, and spirit. But a lot of people don't know about Qigong. And the publisher was really, you know, keen to reach a broader audience. And if you know anything about the publishing world, they look a lot at search engines and Google words or things like that. And Tai Chi is a lot more known in the world. So she said, you know, is there any way that you could include Tai Chi in this in this title? <laughs> And I, I thought about it for a while, and the most comfortable way to approach it was just the objective of practice, which really in Qigong and in internal martial arts and Taoist practices is this idea of uh, balance. And what the Tai Chi access represents or is a, a reminder of is where the, the what, what are called yin and yang energies, right? There's yang, which is sun, light, bright, expansive, and vast. Yin, which is receptive, earth, cool, dark, and grounded. You know, it's sun and it's shade. But when the two come into perfect alignment and balance, that's known as the tai chi, great ultimate polarity. And the moment of balance where everything is in flow is also the moment where we can feel completely, you know, clear and at ease and at one and present and healthy, vibrant, you know, creative, all of that stuff is just, ah, it's right there. In contrast to Wuji, which, you know, it's, um, Wuji is a stance, but it also re represents the primordial nothingness, everythingness, void, um, emptiness, Suchness, thusness, isness. Uh, you know, the, um, it's a, a state of um, undifferentiated oneness. And so we move between these states as uh, living beings, as inanimate objects, even. All things move between this nothingness of Wuji and then the somethingness of Taiji and Taiji oh. axis. You know, Tai Chi is the movement. Wuji is the, the, if you lack for a better word, the vast stillness of nothingness. But Tai Chi is this movement of yin and yang. And the moment that it comes into perfect balance is, um, is, is health, is longevity, is clarity. Hmm. And in the body, you have this as well. So the Tai Chi axis is the balance between the yang most point, which is called the hundred meaning points at the crown of your head, and the yin most point in the torso, which is the base of the pelvic floor. And so in our bodies, we have these manifestations of the yin and the yang energies, and we're working to create that balance as well. And, and what is qi gong? I mean, if you could explain it. So qi is life energy, life force, um, gong means to work or to cultivate. So roughly translating it, it's the cultivation or 
the art of cultivating life energy. But qi, you know, in <laughs> in the Western kind of concepts, it's very difficult to define. But in the Chinese understanding, it's everywhere. You know, you can say your qi se means your facial color is a certain way, or tian qi, which is weather, or sheng qi, which is to give birth to anger, you know, to be angry, sheng qi. So qi is a, a concept or a word is woven into the language so so um, pervasively and it's a blanket term for the 7,000 plus forms of movement and breathing and meditation in China and it's kind of a, a modern term it, it came up in the uh, mid 1800s as a just a term to kind of represent all of these different practices and traditions but its history goes back to you know, 2,500 years ago or more, where people drew on scrolls images of people moving like animals or doing things that look quite fluid um, to expel the the bad toxic energies and draw in, breathe in the the healthy, vibrant ones. Ah, it's really hard to explain, isn't it? I mean, well, you do. I think you do such a great job of explaining, but it's still, it's still yeah. v- very abstract. So what I tell people when they come to a class, <laughs> yeah, they're okay. new. Yeah, yeah. I say qigong is <laughs> um, medical, martial, and spiritual. So it's medical in that it's one of the five main pillars, five pillars of Chinese medicine which include acupuncture, massage, tuina, um, herbs, feng shui, which is how you arrange your house, geomancy. And then the fifth is this movement, it's qigong. You, know, to, to, you have to move the body. I think it was uh, Hua Tuo, who was a Han Dynasty uh, Chinese physician, sort of the father of Chinese medicine. You know, he, he said something like, you need to exercise the body, but never to the point of exhaustion. You know, so, yeah, as as kind of the founder of Chinese medicine, for him to give that endorsement, you know, it says quite a lot um, that that movement is medicine. It's martial in that all martial artists will do qigong to cultivate their life energy and to cultivate health in their organ systems and meridian systems, so as to harness application Mm -hmm. or defense and Mm -hmm. to have good defense you have to have good chi to have good application you have to have healthy clear vibrant strong inner inwardly still chi and then as a spiritual practice it's what a taoist priestess or priest would also use as part of their meditation form or meditation practice whether that's sitting still or moving and if there's kind of an end goal of Taoist practitioner's spirituality, you know, it's to be at one with the natural world. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that <laughs> that's why I love it so much is because it brings so much together, right? I mean, yeah. what what else is martial, medical, and spiritual? Uh, it's... I mean, you called it a, a simple but profound art in your book, which I mm. which, which I loved. Um, and you know, one more concept maybe we can talk about before we 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 try uh, a physical exercise <laughs> is the the five element theory that you learned from Cameron, right? And I, I'm wondering if you could kind of talk a bit more about that. Yeah, explain that to us. Yeah. So. In Chinese medicine and Qigong, the human body is the microcosm of the macrocosm. The macrocosm is just nature. And what that entails is seeing ourselves as very much part of the cycles and rhythms that happen seasonally or happen in a day to night uh, transition uh, or from youth to old age. And broad brush strokes, we have... um, sort of these overarching energies called yin and yang. And they're in constant flow. And there's never yin without yang or yang without yin. And there's always the dot of one and the other. And these uh, originally were kind of, um, you know, they 
yin and yang was a different a differentiation of this primordial energy that I've mentioned, Wu Qi, and that became Taiji, became the yin and yang. And then yin and yang further differentiated into the seasons um, and then into elements. And seasons have either an, a quality of rising yang, like spring, uh, maximum yang, like summer, evenness, like earth, rising yin energy, which is autumn, or maximum energy, which is winter. And then within these seasonal cycles, you have elements that correspond to them. So sometimes they're called phases. Wu xing in Chinese, the direct translation would be a phase because it's not like just one element standing on its own. It's kind of a, a, a cyclical movement. So wood is um, the spring energy. And wood is represented by kind of this growth and expansion. You know, it's very much young energy. Um, and so it's what we see in the spring conventionally of sort of flowers starting to bloom and trees starting to grow and just life. You know, it's youth as well, you know, from when you're born until you're 18, it's kind of that growth period. And then um, fire corresponds to summer, you know, and wood feeds fire. Right, so we feed a, a, a fire more wood to make it grow, and fire related to summer is that time of like you know warmth and brightness and energy and connection and love related to the heart, related to the sun. Um, earth energy then is this, it's often in between the seasons and it transitions in and out of them, but it's also its own season in some schools, and that's late summer where everything kind of hangs in balance. And it's not too cold yet, but it's not as hot as it was at the height of summer. And it's when there's a sense of abundance, like you know, lots of crops are harvested and fruit trees bear fruit and you harvest them. Um, you know, archetypally, it's the mother. It's about kind of steadiness. And, and then and that's balance. And it's very much about balancing all the opposing forces in your life or in your body or in your uh, relationships and then you get to autumn which is related to the element of uh, metal and metal is the rocks the mountains the precious gemstones in the earth fire burns down into earth uh, and then earth creates metal right? so from deep within the earth you can find these precious uh, minerals and uh, rocks, um, gemstones, but you also see them manifested as mountains. And um, metal is a time, though, of falling away, um, it, of cutting. Right? And metal, you know, if you think of a sword or a knife, you know, it cuts away. In nature, what it does in the autumn is start to cull, and it drops off and things drop off. Um, and, you know, temperatures cool, daylight is you know, light hours of the day are, are, are fewer. Um, and then you move to winter, which has the corresponding um, element of water. And water, you know, is uh, nourished by metal. You know, the rocks nourish um, and create kind of a nutrient for metal, but it also, you know, water can arise from, uh, like water vapor comes off of rock so it, it kind of gives rise to that, and it's contained by metal, it's contained by rocks. So water is a, an element is about, um, you know, descending, uh, fluidity, depth, um, darkness, but also it's the most closely associated with the Tao in that it's humble, it nourishes all things without ever being asked. Yeah, it flows to the lowest places where people disdain, you know, and yet it's reflective of everything around us. Uh, and it is um, so strong, right? It carves a Grand Canyon, but it's also very soft. So it's this, this sense of power and softness, which is actually, I would say, the, the essence of Qigong. <laughs> power and softness. It's the balance of yin and yang. It's it's not just one or the other. It's not just flopping your arms around, nor is it bodybuilding. It's just the, the perfect synthesis of the two. 
So then within the five elements, they differentiated this more into your organ system. So every element has an associated organ or pair of organs or fire has four because it's got the heart. Heart's so important. It has a lot of helpers. Um, and then within that differentiation of organ systems, you have like times of day and colors and sounds and smells and characteristics. And all of this is originated from primordial oneness of chi. And so that chi just gets more and more differentiated into what you are inside. And the idea is that through your practice, you can refine and nurture and balance your internal organ energy to be reflective and uh, in balance with what is already in balance in the natural world, okay, which is already in balance with the, the seasons and always at one. Right. Macrocosm, microcosm explained very, very briefly to you. You know, we are chi that is either dense or rarefied. And through our practice, we fill back out into that, that same quality of, you know, imbalanced chi. And you know, what happens though, is that we're often out of balance. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and, and nature sometimes gets out of balance. You know, you have a garden, you know that if you don't water the plants enough or you don't have enough sunlight or the soil doesn't have enough fertilizer, it won't grow anything. You know, it's the same in our bodies. We're, we're, we're nature manifest in, or in human form. And we're, 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 we often don't think of ourselves as a garden. We don't think of ourselves as elementally constituted. We think of ourselves much, much more these days as a machine, you know, interchangeable parts. We got to restore ourselves, recharge our batteries like an iPhone that's died, right? Go on holiday or like maximal, maximum things. productivity, maximum productivity. So that in a nutshell is the five elements. Um, yeah, I think there's so much that I think people um, could benefit from, from just having this connection to everything that is around them, which is everything within them. And a less kind of bifurcated view of, you know, our troubles and conflicts and contradictions of, you know, mental, physical body life um, as separate from what is going on out there in the natural mm. world. Mm. I mean, yeah. interdependent. Yes. So is it kind of like you want to match your internal chi with the external chi of the time, of the moment, of the season, and to be aligned with that? Am I kind of understanding that correctly? Yeah, you could say that to an extent, to, to just... Uh, Remember that we are affected by the seasons and that, excuse me, that what we do also will have an impact in how we feel. And, you know, if you're watering yourself enough, and it's not just about drinking water, it's about hydrating your joints. Right? So, you know, we have synovial fluid in our joints. Science has yet to come up with or, or, or synth, uh, synthesize a solution that is more slippery than synovial fluid. If we, you know, if we don't do things that um, compress the joints and, and uh, eff effectively let the synovial sacs that live inside of your joints release synovial fluid, if that fluid isn't being released, then the space between your joints uh, doesn't have the cushion that it needs nor does it have the opportunity to circulate nutrients, which this fluid also does to the cells there. You don't have blood vessels going there. So that's why it's hard to repair joints. So the synovial fluid is what's circulating nutrient to cellular repair, but cushioning it as well. And if you don't have that, guess what? Cartilage meets cartilage, bone meets bone, and you start to grind bone against bone, which causes arthritis and pain. Which, which I have. And so I selfishly asked Mimi, like, you know, my joints are really dry and, and stiff. And, and I actually have, you know, Mimi, I don't think I told you this, but, you know, I'm going to have to get surgery on my ankle joint because my cartilage is so worn down from 
decades of playing tennis of competitive sports. You know, I do see Qigong as a way to hopefully get some more of that synovial fluid in my joints. And, and as you mentioned in the book, you know, opening the joints is a really big part of the practice, right? So that the qi can flow. And so, yeah, maybe we can go through one exercise to, to, to help do that, or we can talk about Wuji, which you mentioned is really foundational to, to the practice, and spring is upon us as well. So I know it's a, a wood, wood season practice. Yeah. So, um, gosh, Wuji is the foundation of, of Qigong and internal martial arts, and it's also the most advanced practice. So, um, yeah. And so it is very challenging for a lot of people because a lot of, a lot of us don't know or have experience standing still for any length of time. And it becomes very uncomfortable because it asks the muscles to work in a different way than we're maybe used to using them. It's also an energetic practice. So it can bring up quite a lot of issues where energy is not flowing so people will feel dizzy sometimes or they'll feel shaky or they'll 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 um feel their legs fall asleep their feet get numb yeah (laughs) all kinds of things can happen but because it's an energy practice it's you know what happens is sometimes you, you you try to stand you're letting the energy flow by relaxing and then there's a blockage somewhere either it's postural and so the energy can't get through or it's just energetic it's muscular and then that starts to feel uncomfortable so it's very it's very difficult and mentally it's like you know standing still and you, you can't get away from the sensations in your body you know, it's, it's a, a deeply embodied meditative practice it is and in preparation for this talk i've been practicing wuji every day <laughs> nice um, you know for the past week and my feet Feel like they're going to burst into flames. Uh, I really feel the, I would call it a tension in my ankle joints, especially. But at the same time, I've found it so therapeutic. I can like be in my body again and and feel everything in my body and and feel rooted to the ground. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's been my experience so far. So do you want to try it? Should yeah, sure. All right. So if you come to standing. Okay, yeah. Can you see me? I can see you. I'm going to hold my mic so I can also stand and do it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, when would you stand with the feet shoulders distance wide? I'll just give a very, very basic introduction to it. You stand with the toes and feet pointing straight. And you soften the joint spaces. And by softening and relaxing the joint spaces, that means the knees will be slightly bent. You'll feel a gentle dropping of the tailbone down so that you're not standing with the chest forward and the the butt back, but the butt stays, tailbone stays relaxed. And then there's this feeling here of really relaxing the front channel, the front chest. In Chinese, they call this han xiong to contain the chest. The teeth are closed without being clenched. The tongue rests slightly behind your teeth. And you cultivate in a very subtle inward smile to help send some good endorphins, good serotonin messages, messaging through the body. And then allow the chin to lower slightly so that the neck feels like a ballerina's neck. And the crown of the head lifts toward the sky as the base of the pelvic floor draws toward the earth. If you squeeze your arms by the sides of the the legs and waist and then relax them, they, they spring off a little. And that is the the natural falling place for the skeleton. You can add like a gumball size shape underneath the armpit without letting the arms do this, which will strain the outer arms. So there's just a little 
softening. I like to sometimes imagine my arms are, are um, floating in water. Good. And then the breath is centered around the lower abdomen. And the weight is even on your feet. And if people here listening or watching want to do this, you know, even just a couple minutes a day is really helpful for starting to stand with a sense of the Tai Chi axis, rooted into the earth, from the tailbone, pelvic floor down, and open to the sky through the crown of the head up. Relaxed in your body, relaxed in the joint spaces, and aligned between the earth below and the sky above. This is a nice intention energy practice that I'll show you. We can do this just to close. You turn your palms out to the sides and let the arms start to lift, your palms lift, and gathering the tendency maybe to feel ungrounded or uprooted growing in too many directions, too much going on. This can be wood energy. It gets a little excessive. And once the arms are overhead, point your middle fingers towards each other without touching. Your palms face the earth. And then clear these tendencies of being uprooted, ungrounded, overextended. Clear them out of the form of the body. Likewise, wood energy might be deficient. You might not have enough to feel like you can grow. The bloom isn't ready to bloom. And that can be just a feeling of being you know, without vision or purpose, a meekness. I gather that. Any of those tendencies the lack of confidence, we all have that. And then also clear those tendencies out. Sometimes wood is just not rested enough, so there's nothing to grow, not nourished enough, it's hard to grow. And clear those tendencies to be not rested enough, not able to grow, meekness. And then gather this is different. Gather the feeling that you are grounded, steady, and able to you know, grow, create, envision, and, and manifest what you feel is healthy and viable in your life. And fill with that steady foundation, rooted growth. Filling into the space you just cleared. And gather what you've just filled. This capacity to be steady, anchored, rooted. And like you might seal in an envelope before you mail a letter. Seal a Tupperware in the refrigerator with food you want to last more, last longer. Seal in this capacity for steady, rooted growth. And then Put your hands, when you're done, back one over the other onto the lower abdomen. This is your lower dantian. Notice and observe any feeling and sensation in the body or the breath or the thoughts. Good, so you've just done a few minutes of qigong. It was Wuji and uh, clearing, filling, sealing practice. 
that was so good. I had to put my mic down and <laughs> just <laughs> pretend like we're not recording. Oh, uh, that was. Thank you so much. Um, oh, where can we find more of that, Mimi? <laughs> um, there's a lot of resources I have online, and uh, there's you know some free resources on YouTube. There's some um, courses, classes that I offer weekly uh, from you know Zoom or different programs I have that are collaborations with other studios. Um, but also this is, you know, one of the things I love about Qigong is that it doesn't require any special kit. You can do this in, you can do this in work clothes. You can do this anywhere in the park. You can do it while riding a bus. You can do it anywhere. Um, yeah. Uh, so I will, I will link to those, uh, in the show notes. So, you know, people can find you. Um, what tips would you give to someone like me who, you know, wants to make this a regular daily practice? I mean, I know it's like, okay, do it. <laughs> maybe your best <laughs> advice. But, you know, maybe you've seen from, you know, your hundreds of students, like certain obstacles they have with it. And I'm wondering if maybe you could share a few of those tips with us. Yeah. Um, obstacles are just establishing different routines, you know, making, making it a priority. Um, but I would, you know, do something realistic and consistent. So setting up realistic goals, such as I'm going to do 10 minutes of Qigong for the next 10 days, you know, or I'm going to do 10 minutes of Qigong five days a week for the next two weeks. And then reassess at two weeks um, because it, it can feel daunting to think, oh, I've got to carve out you know, 30 minutes or an hour every day and I don't have that time in my life and where am I going to you know, concede something in order to make up time for that. Uh, so you know, a little bit goes a long way and just showing up to you know, some sort of regular practice for yourself or um, doing it, you know, with friends, which can be really encouraging for people. Um, and to know that it's not a practice just for old people, <laughs> you know, it's a big misconception is it's, um, yeah, it's for people who are, you know, over the age of 50 or something. Not that that's old, I'm close to 50. <laughs> um, but you know, I had that notion growing up and also to, to get over the fact that you're not doing very much. I think a lot of people today feel like they need to burn calories and sweat or feel somehow, you know, uh, in pain at the end of a workout and, you know, fatigued. Um, and Qigong has a completely different framework for health and you should never feel depleted from it. You should never push yourself to the point of exhaustion. Um, one of my favorite things to tell people is, you know, Qigong is a practice that circulates your blood without taxing your lungs. It's a profound statement because it points to, A, that you don't need cardiovascular exercise to be healthy, and B, the lungs in Chinese medicine are second in command to the heart, which means the heart is the supreme ruler, emperor, empress, you don't want the person backing up that emperor to be strained, tired, fatigued, overworked, because, you know, you want that person doing its job, like supporting. And when we tax the lungs, it just, it, it, it really taxes the heart. My internal martial arts teacher, my Bagua teacher says, Han chu qi bu chuan, which means the sweat pours, but the breath never quickens. So I might sweat my buckets off, yeah, sweat buckets, sweat my whatever off. Um, and uh, but if the moment that I start breathing too hard, he'll tell me to stop. Uh, yeah. And I don't like to run. <laughs> I don't like feeling out of breath. I don't. I've never liked kind of aerobics and things like that. I just, yeah, it just has never suited me. So. 
for me, this is a blessing because I don't have to do something that's like pounding my joints and getting me out of breath to feel healthy. I can do something that is uh, almost 180 degrees of that, which is movements that are slow, circular, um, and that make you feel warm and circulate the blood. And I can talk about this all I want, but I think it's only when people do it that they realize, wow, I'm hot. You know, and I have students all the time, like, we'll just be doing things that are orbiting, very gentle movements. And at the end, like, I can't believe how warm I feel. I never feel this warm. Like, I never feel circulation in my hands and feet like this. It's not about burning calories. It's not about that at all. It's really about supporting your body's ability to be healthy. And it's about um, (laughs) also just doing less. And this is another big misconception, you know, that that Qigong, you're not getting anything done. <laughs> you're hardly moving. And there was a, a, a friend, a teacher who years ago put something up on Facebook and I was a little offended at first. And then I kind of sat with it and I realized like, oh, you know what? This is really interesting. She said, I just don't get Qigong. <laughs> Yeah. Is it like the emperor's new clothes? I'm just going to say it. <laughs> and at first, like, I was like, hmm. But then I, I sat with it, and it's true. There's nothing to get. It. And that's almost the purpose of it, which is very hard for our very inquisitive, linear, you know, kind of society. It's meditation. Like, and where you're getting is the present moment. And where you're getting is awareness and awakeness. And it's here. You're not going deeper. You're not grasping and wanting and pushing away so much as just recognizing those tendencies and softening them and and very much embracing the the you know the flow of experience and letting yourself feel in the flow of experience. And one of the things I love is like it's references to the natural world, right? So you'll you'll do something like this, separate clouds. It's like you can't, your hands can't do that. The clouds won't separate from you doing this. And yet, you know, as you're doing it, you're with those clouds. You're feeling not um, uh, dissociated from your body, but I would say and argue completely more at home with the body, which is inclusive of rain, water, cloud, like that's in us. And we just, we open up some space to, and, and to, to be with it and make room for it and to respect it in the body um, and feel closer to it. It's not sexy either, you know, Qigong <laughs> compared to yoga, especially like one-handed handstands and a deep back bend, you don't get that stuff, right? So I think, you know, common obstacle is that it's, it's not just, it's just, you know, people think I look funny doing it. And it's not as Instagrammable. That might be a big obstacle. <laughs> um, but it's not, you know, and it is starting to get more widely marketed. And um, I'm a little wary of some of the the videos I've seen of just, you know, kind of flashy Qigong. And it's like, mm, but that's not actually, it doesn't look right in the form. You know, it's kind of overextended. But it's also just like, you know, the fun, the foundational quality of Qigong is humility. And it's like, my teacher says this, my shifu says this all the time. What you're doing is not anything, you're not trying to do things to be seen. You're doing things to see yourself. Love that. Mm. That's true. Yeah, it, yeah. 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 And so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it, you know, as, as a beginner, is there a sort of feeling I should strive for in my practice, whether it's like that feeling of warmth that I guess means that the blood is circulating well? I or, wouldn't or, strive. Sorry, I wouldn't strive for anything. <laughs> exactly. Just, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So just like everything you're saying, just being, being there with whatever is happening, right? Being present with that. Notice how you feel afterwards. Yeah. And, you know, that was uh, another really interesting part of your book is um, when you talk about each of the seasons 
And um, you talk about how each season kind of has an emotion and a feeling. And I, I'm just going to say this sentence that you wrote. When in balance, Wood's emotion manifests as anger with clear purpose. And I just really love that because, you know, usually we're, we don't think that anger is a, a, a good thing. Um, we don't want to be angry or we've been told not to be angry, but it kind of touched me in the sense that, yeah, it's okay to, to like you said, feel all these range of things and be in balance. Yeah. Yeah. All the emotions are valid. And because so, so often we think of <clears throat> ourselves as a human being as not part of nature. And so we think of these emotions as unnatural or wrong. But because we are part of nature, an emotion is natural. Like when having emotions is part of being human. And it's about starting to s recognize when the emotions are expressed in healthy ways and when they start to be expressed in unhealthy and overdramatic ways that undermine our well-being or the well-being of others. So I feel... Anger is, is a very misunderstood one. Grief as well, very misunderstood. Everyone wants joy, but joy is often misunderstood. Joy can be exhausting. You know, <laughs> I often think of um, Robin Williams, who was always so up. And underneath that, it was exhausting for him and, and, and violent. But anger is especially one that I feel... Especially in today's world, there's a lot we can be angry about, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the world towards changing what is socially in unjust and, and unequal and um, destructive towards the environment, um, but how to use our anger not in a way that is causing more destruction, but is creative and, and points towards humaneness right? in a a sensitivity and a, a positive action. Yeah. It's a challenge. It is. <laughs> yeah. But Martin Luther King was the perfect example of, uh, I think in his younger years of like humane, just anger, justifiable and, and just like fair. Yeah. But it was, it was governed by love. So yeah, there's that opportunity with wood energy. Yes. So I do encourage all of you listening to buy the book. Like, you know, I mean, it is, it's really, it's dense. The, the, the introduction is short and covers the concepts, but then, you know, each season has many practices you can do. And it's almost like a almanac for me, you know, to look at what exercises, you know, I can focus on to help me. Mimi, I, I'm starting a new thing with the podcast. So I want to close out really quickly with a lightning round, just something to, to end on, on a light note. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to ask you five random questions and yeah, just the first answer that comes to mind, go for it. Yeah. We'll do sure. this quick. Sounds so good. who do you admire most at the moment? Cheryl Strayed. She's a, she is an author. Um, I'm reading a book called tiny, beautiful things. And she has an uncanny ability to give compassionate, straightforward advice in a way that doesn't judge and, mm. uh, and, and is done through genius expert storytelling. Love it. If you could spend your perfect day doing anything, what would you do? <laughs> oh, uh, mostly what I do these days, I think. <laughs> That's the best answer. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I I uh, wake up at 5, 5.30, play with my dog, eat my breakfast, meditate, train, and then by the time I'm done with all that, it's like 10 or 11. <laughs> then I, I do some computer work, cook lunch, eat lunch, nap, work in the garden, do a little bit more work. If I have a writing project, I'll work a little bit on that in the morning. And then play piano and read. Um, and then, you know, I have a couple dog walks and puppy kind of 
play dates during that day as well or <laughs> so it's, it's pretty much how i am now that sounds so serene um if you could snap your fingers and have one wish come true what would it be for compassion to enter people's hearts and last question what is the best or most worthwhile investment you've ever made Ah, oh, mm, buying this house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You have to tell us about your house. I mean, you can't just say buying this house. Oh, just moving to the countryside. I think that's been... Okay, yeah. Big. I've lived in urban centers and cities for so long. So investing in a home in the country. Yeah. Can I just, uh, you know, ask, like, how has that helped you, you know, as opposed to being in Beijing or being in, in the middle of this, these big cities? My uh, daily rhythm has changed a lot. I feel a lot more in tune with uh, the subtleties of the seasons and the changes in, in the seasons. I spend a lot more time outside and in nature. Oh, okay, My now I'm getting jealous. <laughs> ground a lot more, you yeah, know, yeah. everything. But yeah. I just, I feel more myself. Mm. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for sharing this time with us, Mimi. I, yeah. I uh, always really enjoy it, and I always learn so much. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, and good questions. <laughs> Fun, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe and leave us a review on your podcast app. It helps more people discover the show. Also, you can find all the show notes and links mentioned in this episode at upstartist.tv ace. That's A-S-E. Hope to see you there.